Good afternoon. I apologize for rolling in here a little late. I'm hot off of uh, Puppet Camp Austin. And, I don't know, boo? We say boo? Like, we have to artificially like make this one awesome, right? Everyone here is much more beautiful than that. But it's Texas, so what can you do? Uh, I lived there, I lived in Austin for like 15 years, which probably explains why I'm not as beautiful as everyone else here. Um, man, I'm used to the, I'm used to the lavalier microphone, this feels very uh, American Idol. Um, I've only got a couple of dance moves, I, I, I could do the, uh, the reach for the stars, the digging for gold, and maybe like, just bring it home. That's all I got. All right, so that's me. Um, I'm based out of Denver. I think I'm one of the two or three Puppet Labs employees based out of Denver. Um, but as Mike mentioned, I, uh, I manage Puppet Labs Engineering and I'm sort of a head of architecture there. Uh, so if you've been on IRC or on the mailing list or anything like that, I'm grammatical on there. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a keynote, even though it's the middle of the day. Uh, so A, appreciate staying awake, but if you're not off, I won't, I won't think too, too poorly of you. Um, but, you know, the purpose of a keynote, I figure, is to do a couple of things. Number one is you want to make some, you know, broad, sweeping, uh, erroneous predictions about how things are going to work. Uh, and you sort of want to set the stage for things and implant seeds so that people have stuff to actually talk about and kind of anchor the rest of the stuff. So a, a lot of this isn't going to be mega puppet specific. I mean, so there's going to be a lot of stuff maybe about sort of IT in general, automation in general. Um, so maybe that'll be a welcome change of pace. Um, and then we'll kind of get into sort of like, okay, well, how does puppet address some of these problems? Um, but maybe to help me level set, it's customary for us to start off all of these with the the shaming slash showing of hands. Um, so who is using Puppet right now? Okay, so that's like 80% of people, all right. Uh, who is using uh, another automation tool? Okay, it's so like 10, 20%, something like that. Um, who is using automation, but it's stuff that you wrote yourself, or is homegrown? Okay, it's no shame. Uh, a friendly place, it's no shame. Until you answer this question, which is who is not doing any automation, but is looking to. Okay, well, so that guy. Uh, <laughs> it's cool, you're, you're in the right place. Everything, everything will be fine. And of the people that are, are using Puppet or that aren't using it at all, uh, how many of you would consider yourselves sort of fairly new to it? Okay, so about, about half. So that, that kind of that kind of makes sense. Um, it's interesting because I think this is a very different kind of demographic than relative to maybe two years ago. I've been working with, uh, I've been working at Puppet Labs for about four years, and prior to that, I ran Puppet uh, for a pretty long time and was a contributor to a bunch of stuff, uh, have a bunch of patches in there. Um, and I think you asked two years ago, it was definitely, I think things were very much skewed towards the, yep, automation, doing it forever, been using this stuff forever, pretty skilled practitioner. And I think it's interesting, I actually really like it, that we're now starting to expand into kind of spheres of influence that, you know, automation is new, or you haven't been doing it for as long, and a lot of people are trying to figure out just how to bring some of the existing practices that they have kind of into this new universe where all, there are a lot more demands on time, and automation becomes a lot more necessary. So, uh, this statement will hopefully not be controversial to anyone, but I would say that there is a lot going on in the universe of sort of IT and operations in general, right? Like, uh, I think there's an increasingly large number of problems that need to be solved. I think usually the problems that need to be solved are of an increasing sophistication, usually because if it's a security issue, it's a more sophisticated attack. If it's a system that you need to provision, it usually involves more, more servers. If it's an application that you need to deploy, it usually involves cooperation between a wider variety of systems than maybe software stacks that you've had to deploy in the past. None of this shit gets any easier, um, which on the one hand, you see a lot of us getting fully employed, but on the other hand, is somewhat terrifying, right? And I think you combine that with sort of new technologies, new methodologies that people are trying to adopt, and it, you know, it's, it's very easy to, it's very easy to become overwhelmed. So, you know, so what in the world is, you know, a system man supposed to do? This is documentary footage of a systems administrator. Uh, it's black and white, that's how you know it's, that's how you know it's true. Um, so, uh, the life of a systems administrator is oftentimes uh, 
difficult, tedious, and, and frustrating, and very frequently, I would say, it's thankless. Uh, how many of you feel that you receive an appropriate amount of thanks for the system administration? <laughs> no one? All right. Uh, not a shock. Uh, so I think, I think a lot of this kind of comes back to sort of the old idea of the um, sort of like the hero's paradox or like the firefighter's paradox, you know, uh, is, is kind of one example. Where for those of you who haven't heard it, it's kind of like, house is on fire, you know, you live in a neighborhood, house is catching on fire, it's three in the morning, you ring the bell at the fire department, people slide down the poles, they hop in the trucks, they go out there, they put out the fire, and then at the end of the day, they save the cat, uh, you know, everything, everything's wonderful. They get your, you know, your box full of Nintendo games, you know, from, from 1989. Everything's great. And I think everybody shakes their hand, and it's like, congratulations, you saved a bunch of lives, you did a fantastic job. That's a truly heroic effort that we need to recognize you for. So that's good, you know, obviously we need that, right? Contrast that uh, with maybe the experience of someone who sits at a desk in some kind of planning division inside downtown Denver Municipal Building who works on fire codes or safety regulations, or new building materials that need to be put in to prevent fires from spreading in the first place. If fires never start, how much recognition do you think that person gets for saving a huge number of lives? Now that isn't to say that one group of people is more important than the other, right? Obviously they're both extremely important, but I think a lot of times in IT we've kind of gotten into this mode where you look at someone, you, you know, you're on a team with someone it's like, oh man, this, this person, they, get, they wake up at two in the morning, they get paged, they come in, they log on, they restart the service, and then they go back to sleep, and then you come to work on Monday, and it's like, that that was wonderful. You came in on a weekend, you fixed this thing, that was great. We compare that, I would say maybe that's goofus, compare that to Gallant, sort of like, ah, I just wrote something that, you know, I deployed the service in such a way that that would never happen. <laughs> and uh, who gets the recognition, and who's actually doing something better? Like who's actually making the life, uh, who's actually making the business better, right? And, and I think we're kind of seeing a transition out of that, right? Like maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I think we were very much mired in this like rewarding heroic efforts kind of thing. And frankly, I think a lot of that was because a ton of businesses didn't even have metrics and stuff to track. Like what numbers really matter for my business, right? Whereas nowadays, you know, there's starting to see companies you walk in in the lobby, they've got an LCD. It's like these are the eight numbers that we need to care about. So if you were working in a company where you cared about uptime, suddenly maybe you wouldn't be rewarding the person that wakes up at three in the morning to restart a bunch of stuff after it's been down for hours, right? You'd be rewarding them the person who actually designed a system that has higher uptime. So I think that's just one example of a cultural shift that, that's, that's happening. So an interesting thing is that I think, that even that said, I do think that now, because of increasing demands that are placed on operations personnel, like, I think, Many of us are constantly in a state of reaction to what's going on. You know, we're always reacting to tickets, we're reacting to changes in the environment, changes to infrastructure, new features that need to be deployed, new software that needs to be put out there, new security threats that need to be patched. So at this point, it's kind of interesting, it's 2015, we've actually hit the point where system administration has been going on for long enough that the scientists get involved and they're able to start doing studies and compute numbers and statistics about our jobs. So. A, that sucks, and B, it's kind of interesting if you're a super nerd like me. So one interesting statistic is that systems administrators that have been studied uh, turn out to be interrupted on average once every 15 minutes. How many feel that that describes, you know? Okay, how many people think 15 minutes is too conservative? Okay, there you go. Um, now what's interesting is the corollary to that is when they track system and performance, they find out that after they're interrupted, it usually takes 30 minutes to get back into the zone. So that's pretty shitty. <laughs> if you do the math, that basically means that you are never going to get back into a state where you can actually sort of free up your brain to think about higher level things that you're supposed to be thinking about, right? Um, so that, I mean, that, that, that's a tough spot to be in. Um, and I think that combined with their continual pressure to want to do more stuff, do it faster, do it for less money and with fewer errors, you know, I mean, it basically leaves a lot of us in positions where, you know, we weren't hired, most of us probably were not hired to literally eight hours a day, you punch in and then we're just changing passwords on systems, eight hours a day, and then you punch out and then you go home. I'm almost positive that was not the reason. That is not why, that is not the valuable skill set that you have that people are paying you money for. And maybe what you do, 
but I don't think that's the most value the company is getting out of that. If you could automate that problem away, that's time you could spend during your day actually thinking about like, ah, maybe this software is kind of a piece of junk and should be deployed a totally different way. Maybe our network sucks and if we rejiggered this whole thing, that would make our lives a whole lot easier. These are things you don't get to think about if all you're doing is changing passwords all day. And which one is more valuable to the business? So, you know, I think, I think it's worth thinking about. I think another interesting change has happened in the past, you know, maybe decade or something like that. I mean, um, for those of you who, like me, are are, are old, um, we hired a lot. Of, I hire a lot of engineers, and a lot of them that came in recently are like 22. And must think I'm the freaking crypt keeper. Um, and then I realized, like, even a reference to the crypt keeper wouldn't make any sense. Tales from the crypt. Yeah. So. For those of you who were around in sort of like the late 90s, early 2000s, sort of in the industry, there was this movement where people wanted to outsource everything. Because, you know, people thought, ah, you know what, I don't really care about technology because I'm a pet store, or I sell furniture, or I do insurance. So why don't I just give that to people who just work on software all day, and they'll just make that problem go away from me. Um, so that didn't work. So I think what you're actually seeing recently is now there's a completely opposite movement, which is, you want to bring all of that stuff back in house, right? And I think that's basically indicative of the fact that at this point, like at this day and age, it doesn't matter if you're a pet store or a furniture store or a taxi company. Like every company is a technology company now. Like there isn't a single company that, you know, I mean, any company that we're probably working for is a tech company. Any large company is a tech company. Like technology, IT is a huge part of what actually makes that business successful. And, you know, if IT isn't a competitive advantage for you in the business that you're in. It's probably a competitive advantage of someone who's going to destroy you, like pretty quickly. I mean, like I, I mean, it's you know, 2014 happens, and then all of a sudden, taxi companies are like, wait a minute, people would actually want to know like where their taxi is when they request it, and how long it's going to take, and they don't want to call up and be on hold when they order one, because that's what Uber does, and you know, now that. That makes a ton of money, and as a user experience, I think that was a huge shock to the system, right? From an established business, it's like, why do I even need to do this? Because it turns out, if you can actually turn your operations into, it's jujitsu, right? Like, you have an IT department already. If you could use that as a strength instead of a weakness, then overall your business is probably going to be in a better spot than you would have been otherwise. And I think you see that time and time again. Businesses get disrupted by competitors that are really good at this kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, I think, I think we need to get there at some point. Um, and I think, and, and you know, obviously I think a big theme of this is uh, it's not just about raw technology, right? Like, it's not enough to say, like, uh, I mean, some puppets, obviously all my IT problems are going away. Because I, I think that's, I mean, as much as I would like to think that, I don't think that's realistic. It's a combination of technology um, along with sort of cultural changes, along with you know, is the technology you're using really enabling you to do stuff faster? Is it really enabling you to do stuff more reliably? Um, and are you using it to kind of up-level the kind of stuff that you're trying to manage and automate and that you're in charge of? Uh, and if you're not, then you should probably be changing the technology you use or repurposing it to help you along those ways. So again, in sort of the vein of statistics, uh, we've done this for the past couple of years, but Papa Labs does a, uh, a survey. We do a DevOps survey. Um, so actually, okay, I assume everyone here has heard of DevOps. Who here has not heard of DevOps? Okay, who here can describe what DevOps is in one sentence or less? <coughs> that's what I thought. Uh, it's like modern art. <laughs> Whatever you think it is, that's what it is. The real DevOps has been inside of you the whole time. <laughs> You've had the tools in here, you didn't need any software. Uh, so, so I, I like to I like to describe DevOps sort of like as a, not not with a definition, but maybe qualitatively, right? Like, what are the practices that people associate with DevOps, right? Like, you can't define what it is, but you at least know if you're doing a certain set of things, a certain set of behaviors. Maybe that's considered a DevOps practice, right? Um, so, you know, I, and I also like to find a DevOps maybe by uh, what it's not. Um, so, you know, again, contrast sort of modern operations with maybe how it was 10 years ago, or 15 years ago, or whatever. And I would say maybe back then, uh, 
who it is. I would say maybe if systems administrators like 10 years ago uh, were a political party, like our banner would be, our slogan would be, no, we can't. <laughs> right? But it's basically like, don't bother me. I can't do that. I can't do that. Yeah, you want me to deploy this thing? Yeah, I'll do that like in two weeks. Oh, you want to support for a different operating system because that's what you want to develop on? Yeah, that's, you're going to have to go through the board and that's going to take you, you know, like you know, two quarters before you get that done. You want your password to reset? Yeah, I'll get to that. Your call is important to me. I'll answer it in the order in which it was received. I think it was very easy for us to kind of fall back on you know, these gates and the process and stuff like that. And, you know, basically I think we're sort of the party of saying no. And I think what DevOps is about is it wants to transition all of us from that mentality to like the party of saying yes. You want a new operating system? That's not a big deal. We can totally do that in, you know, a matter of hours. Password reset, why is that even an issue anymore? Um, you need to have a port open and some firewall. Like, sure, that's easy. Like, you know, that, those are the kinds of things I think that the DevOps movement is primarily oriented around. It's like, how do we change our culture inside of our companies, and how do we change the tools we use, and how our operations teams are organized and how they do work to actually make us be able to say yes way more often and way more quickly. So when we did this survey, uh, we got about literally over 9,000 uh, sort of organizations and uh, individuals that replied. Um, and we were asking them sort of, what practices do you employ? And the most important part was we were like, because uh, here's the thing, right? If there, let's say there's a bunch of DevOps best practices, whatever the hell that means, right? Like it's IT, there's a million best practices for everything and none of them agree with each other. What we really want to figure out is if you adopt a certain practice, does that actually have an impact on like how much money you make or how good your business is doing? Because if it doesn't, it doesn't matter how many people with like really nice suits tell you that that's a best practice because it's irrelevant. Right? This industry is very fashion oriented, right? So ultimately, if you can't prove that something you're doing is actually useful, why are we wasting our time doing it? Um, now the interesting thing though is I think a lot of the results we got back confirmed a lot of stuff that I don't think was at least statistically verifiable before. Um, but are things that many of us had suspected. Um, so a couple of things I wanted to call out, I think number one was basically companies that have strong IT departments, they, they, have high, they consider themselves having high performing IT departments, that turns out to be a competitive advantage, literally. And by that I mean firms that have high performing IT departments are twice as likely to exceed profitability targets than those who don't. Uh, they're twice as likely to, see, to exceed market share um, goals that they have than those who don't. Um, and any productivity metrics that they have internally, they're twice as likely to hit those compared to those who don't. So I think that's good. I think that means that if you're in IT, you're kind of in a very important part of the business. You know, so don't let anybody tell you that an operations team or an IT team is, is, is drag. Because it's not. It's truly something that if you're good at, it's, it's a huge impact on the actual bottom line. I think the next thing that came out of it was again, probably reinforcing of stuff that people already know, which is the DevOps practices tend to improve the performance of an IT department. So IT, IT department's performing better, great for the business. The more DevOpsy things that you do, your IT department tends to perform better. So specifically, this correlates with like well-known practices like Subversion control, continuous delivery, continuous integration, like all those types of things. There are still tons of businesses out there that don't do all of that stuff, right? And there are probably plenty of shops that some of you are working at that don't do all those things. Or you're working towards it, but you're not quite there yet. So the good news is, is all those endeavors will have, you know, they should have meaningful impact on the way that you do stuff, which I, which I think is good. Um, next one is that uh, organizational culture actually matters. Not just IT culture, but the culture of the whole organization. Um, and it turned out that this was one of the strongest predictors of IT performance and the performance of the overall company. Which I guess makes sense, right? Like, how many of you work in an environment currently where there are things you want to do as an operations person, but there are other parts of the organization that stand in the way? Okay, so that's, that's maybe half of the room, right? So the point I think that this, this line of reasoning hits on is that it's not enough necessary. I mean, automation of pockets helps. Like if you're an ops team and you just do your part of it and you do it way better, that helps. You know, no joke, I mean, that's, that's good stuff. But I think you're gonna quickly become limited. You know, it's like a local maxima, right? But you wanna globally optimize the whole business. And in order to forget from that peak to one that's genuinely higher, I think you kinda need to have buy-in from larger parts of the organization that 
a focus on automation is better. Maybe you need to break up a lot of the silos that used to be there. You know, I mean, you would previously see things like, you know, in the past you have a team of people that manage an app, and a team of people that manage the base operating system, and a team of people that manage ports in a firewall, and a team of people that do this, which means if I want to deploy a new application, I now suddenly need to coordinate like 18 different groups of people and get so many checks, you know, signed off, and all that kind of stuff, which, you know, I think is fine, and those all serve probably reasonable purposes, but organizationally, if you really believe that you need to streamline that whole process, then that really means maybe you need to break apart some of those structures. Maybe you need to put some of those people together on the same team so you can make decisions more quickly, or people don't feel like they're working against each other and antagonizing each other. Like, I'm a security guy, of course I'm going to say no. I'm going to say no to everything. You know, because if I say no to everything, I'm probably not going to have any more vulnerabilities to you letting people deploy new stuff. But that's not the way a business should work. You should feel empowered to deploy new things and do it in a secure way. It should be about collaboration and not like putting the brakes on a bunch of stuff. So lastly, and I thought this was really fascinating, was all that other stuff said, all that other impact on the business said, the thing that had the number one biggest impact on how a business would perform is job satisfaction, self-reported job satisfaction. People, which makes a ton of sense because if you hate your job, you are probably not going to excel at it. If anyone wants to work at a place that sucks, right? And I think when people were asked sort of what are the key things that relate to job satisfaction, you know, they say things that in retrospect when I read them, I'm like, yeah, it's common sense, but it's basically I want to have a lot of responsibility, but I also want to have a lot of autonomy to make decisions. I need to have decision making power so I can actually do stuff that I want to do. I want people to trust that I'm doing the right thing and I want to have the ability to do these kinds. And what are the types of organizations that make that kind of stuff possible? Like, what are the types of organizations that give operations personnel autonomy and responsibility and freedom to do a lot of these things? They're the businesses that have all the automation in place to make sure you can do that in a safe way, in a structured way, in a way that's empowering to people. And then what are the companies that don't do that? That's sort of the stodgy company, the IT departments of yesteryear. I mean, it's 2015, and if you're still doing stuff the way that you were doing it 10 or 15 years ago, and you're in the business of telling all of your ops personnel, like, you can't do that, or that's impossible, or that's gonna take 18 months for us to get that approved. How empowering is that you know, to any of your sysadmins? Like, that kind of sucks. So, you know, the future is moving more towards, like, giving people the responsibility and autonomy to do the things they want, and making sure that we have all the structure and tech in place under the hood to make that not a total disaster. So with great power comes great responsibility. Um, it can't be a keynote on anything if you don't talk about cloud. Uh, I highly recommend, by the way, the, uh, the cloud to butt plugin uh, for whatever browser you use, uh, for Firefox or Chrome. Uh, it literally replaces every port, every instance of the word cloud on a web page with the word butt, uh, which is pretty great, except if you've had it on for a really long time and then you go to a web browser that doesn't have it, you're like, whoa, what is all this? This is not really as hilarious anymore. Um, TechCrunch becomes way more boring to read. Uh, so, um, again, sort of snapshot from 10, 15 years ago to now, obviously, uh, cloud infrastructure has put a, a very different, it, it's thrown a wrench, I think, to a lot of ways that people used to think about stuff. Um, it's helped in a lot of ways. I mean, selfishly, I think it's helped me in a lot of ways because now it's possible to, you know, 15 years ago, if someone said, yep, uh, you can spin up a thousand machines after you swipe a credit card, uh, and then when you're done with them after 90 minutes, you can just burn them all back down to the ground, and that's totally cool. Uh, people would have thought that was insane. But if you think about it, what does that actually mean, right? Like, if you can spin up a thousand machines and you're in a business that could take advantage of that, you can't do that unless you have some level of automation in place, right? Uh, otherwise, you will literally be spending like weeks and weeks and weeks getting all these things like provisions, set up the exact way you want them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, and, and I also would say that, you know, kind of related to this would be, you know, now there's a whole host of like software as a service types of things is that I think now that that sliver of stuff that people wanted to outsource like 15 years ago, it didn't make any sense. I think now you're actually starting to see people be much more sensible about that. And they're like, Okay, you know what, like, I care about managing, like, CRM or something like that, but I can just pay Salesforce and rent, you know, an account from them every month instead of having to maintain that infrastructure and develop that software in-house. 
like I don't have to do that anymore. There's a whole bunch of like cloud-related services that I think people can take advantage of that are very cool in that regard. Because I think it helps people figure out like the buzzword, you know, the MBA buzzword would be like, what is your core competency as a business? But it can't be everything. Like there's certain things that you care about you need to be like pretty kick-ass at, otherwise you're gonna be ruined as a business. But those other things, maybe you can actually start sending to other vendors and maybe that'll be okay. Um, you don't necessarily have to be a company that runs your own email infrastructure anymore. Like we don't. I mean, we give it to Google, so I assume they know probably far too much about me than I probably would like. Um, I bought an infrared, I bought a totally unrelated, my wife bought me an infrared thermometer like a year ago uh, for cooking, just because I think they're cool, it's like a little bit point and stuff. Uh, and now she's just been, I've been getting recommendations for the ghost hunting stuff <laughs> for like the last year, uh, which, is, which is pretty great. Um, anyway, um, you know, so, so I think we're, we're at a unique point in time where we need to figure out sort of, I think a lot of companies need to figure out like, what does this mean to existing workflows and existing infrastructure that you already have, right? And I think, again, this is sort of where people need to divorce like the hype machine from reality. Right, which is kind of a critical skill for any sysadmin, I would say. But you know, a year after EC2 launched, I mean, there were articles everywhere claiming like, no one's gonna need to run any hardware anymore because everything will be done entirely in EC2. Why wouldn't you? Because it's great. How many people are currently running all of their infrastructure in a, a cloud environment? That's kind of what I would expect. How old is your company? Seven years. That's pretty good. <laughs> You're on the tip of the spear. Yeah. But the um, but I think a ton of people, I think the fact that that's a pretty small minority kind of goes to show that there's a huge number of processes and, and workflows and just workloads out there that don't really fit well into that pattern, either because of established practices or cost or security or whatever else you need, right? Now I don't mean to say that that's not gonna change like relatively soon, right? Like you're starting to be like, you can get PCI compliance stuff into EC2 now. Right, so now you're starting to see things like banks and stuff like that roll into these environments that before would have been considered unheard of. Right, so I think all this stuff is gonna change. The important point I think I want people to take out of this is just that what are the demands that are placed upon you by the advent of pretty radically different ways of doing infrastructure? Right, like you can't necessarily take all the ways that you would have managed your infrastructure before and directly apply all of them to an environment that looks like this. I mean, hell, even just on the puppety side of things, I mean, there's stuff like, how do you manage certificates and stuff like that? Do you turn auto sign on? You can't just go in and automatically, like, manually sign every new cert for a thousand new systems that come up because that's dumb. That doesn't make any sense in an environment that's highly elastic when you can do stuff like that. Which is why, you know, as the vendor, like, we've had to put in features and stuff like that to kind of allow people that enable them to do things in a secure but still automatable way. But the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, we need to figure out just what this actually means to the business. A corollary to that, I think, is containerization. And I think kind of like virtualization, you know, this has similarly placed a lot of new, interesting kind of spins on how people manage their current infrastructure. Um, you know, and I think, as it's, uh, how many people are currently running containers in production? Okay, not that many. How many think, like, Docker or Solaris Zones had that shit, like, 15 years ago? <laughs> and how many people are like, Solaris Zones mainframes had that stuff, like, 30 years ago? <laughs> that was a trick to help the mainframe people, by the way. So, <laughs> beers are on that. Um, the, uh, but, you know, but I think, and this is obviously very different depending on sort of what hype bubble you inhabit, right? Because depending on what weblogs you read, it's sort of like, oh, everybody's containerizing everything. What am I doing with my life? Like, no one needs me. But, you know, obviously that's not true. It's a tool, and it's a tool that can be leveraged in a wide variety of contexts. And I think even the Docker community, well, you know, there's now Docker, there's Rocket, there's a whole bunch, you know, there's a, a giant ecosystem that I think has been built around this stuff. But I think right now it's, it's kind of a bloodbath, I would say. I'm pretty sure uh, someone's gonna make a billion dollars out of it. Uh, if I knew who that was, I wouldn't be standing here right now. Uh, um, I'm usually not right about those things. Um, so it's clear that it's pretty transformative technology now that it's much more easily uh, available to a wider, uh, to a bigger audience you know, than it was previously available for. Um, but, I mean, even within the containerization community, there are huge debates about, for example, uh, if you have a container, do you run one process in that container? 
You know, is it like a mega microservice kind of thing? Or is it sort of like a super lightweight virtualization? You know, where you just get way better density, you know, out of your systems, but you still get some isolation. That is a huge debate. That's like the VI versus Emacs of the containerization world, right? And I'm sure they'll sort that out after 30 years. Um, I use Emacs as VI key binding, so I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Uh, but you know, I think that just goes to show that there's still there's still a ton of people that are trying to sort out what exactly the impact of that technology is going to have on the way that they do stuff. Um, and if you're a company that maybe has a huge amount of existing virtualization and the biggest problems you have are density, you know, then why not approach containers as sort of a, a move to improve sort of the density of your systems and you can smash more things together. But if you're kind of like, I just started this program in my garage like three days ago and I'm gonna get venture funding and I can do all this stuff from scratch and it's gonna be super microservice to the wazoo, then I think that's fine too, you know? But maybe that's easier if you don't have existing stuff and you can build new things that kind of work in that way. So I think you're starting to see a lot of this stuff and, and people are trying to figure out exactly how their existing practices relate to this. The one thing I will say is that, um, and I don't know if this is a mega, I mean, I don't hear this very often, but every once in a while it comes up, and it, it, it kind of comes up anytime there's sort of a, a new thing, and I think it's like, why do I need any kind of automation or configuration management when I have Nets? You know, if I have the cloud, why do I need to have any kind of configuration management? If I have virtual machines, why do I need config management? I just do snapshots for everything, man. <laughs> snapshots. VMware has got a library manager, and that only costs like, I don't know. Um, you know, same thing. Like, why do you need config management when you can have containers that somehow take care of all this stuff for you? So, uh, as an interesting experiment, a couple of us at Puppet kind of went back and we tried to find the earliest references to the concept of configuration management. Right? What decade do you think uh, was the inception of configuration management? How many think uh, 90s? Or more recent, 80s. It's a good decade. Good stuff. <laughs> hair. 70s. Also hair. Um, 60s. That's pretty close. 50s. All right. I'm gonna assume other people just don't know. It's 1800s. No, it's <laughs> so the earliest record, record I could find um, was actually done by the U.S. military in the 1950s. Uh, if, if, if you want a rousing read, I recommend Mill HDBK61, <laughs> which you can get a PDF of, but it's literally like configuration management for military systems. And what are they? And this is in the 50s, so what they're talking about isn't even computers. They're talking about like consoles with a zillion buttons on them that will launch missiles and do whatever kinds of stuff you need to do. But they talk about the characteristics of configuration management and what's important. And here's what they say. They say, number one, you need to be able to inventory what you have so you know what's out there and you know what you need to manage. Number two, you need to have some control over how you make changes to those things because you don't want some random person going in and flipping a bunch of switches and then leaving them that way. Number three, you need to have some structured process for actually initiating those changes. And then number four, you need to be able to audit and verify that the stuff you wanted to do was actually done. So you don't leave the stuff in a state that wasn't what you intended it to be. That was 1950s. That stuff is all completely valid today. It doesn't matter if you're running containers. It doesn't matter if you're running VMs. It doesn't matter if you've got a rack of gear. All that stuff is the same stuff that we need now. But like we need that same stuff now that they needed way back then. Because um, it turns out like configuration isn't just like um, you know a packaging thing. You know, basically like what are the inputs to your infrastructure that you care about? And how do you manage those inputs? How do you change them over time? And how do you audit those changes you know, throughout the life cycle of the infrastructure that you have? And that's true, if anything, the ability to spin up more infrastructure and tear it down super quickly just amplifies the need for all of that stuff. So I don't think any of this is going away. I think it's just going to become more important. The tools will have to evolve, certainly. But I think the stuff you invest in today, I think those practices that you invest in today will still have tons of dividends for time to come. So, um, you know, so I mentioned in the past that, you know, sort of the IT being the party of no. Um, but I think what's happened, though, is that maybe back then, uh, you could say no and people would listen to you. Uh, now, I think you're starting to see way more situations where if you tell the development team, like, nah, yeah, I can't provision that stuff for you. They're like, fine, I'm just gonna put my credit card number in and spin up a zillion instances on EC2. Or if you tell a sales department or a marketing department, like, yeah, I can't get a file share set up for you with the account until like four weeks from now. They're like, 
Okay, this is all going, all our confidential stuff is going on Dropbox with a shared password. And this is, this is shadow IT. It's IT that's happening. It's just IT that doesn't have visibility. It's covert. And the reason why it has to happen that way is because the traditional means of doing all that stuff isn't sufficiently accommodating for the needs of the business. So people go around it. And now, with all of these services that you can take advantage of, that has never been easier. And I would say that's not good. I mean, it's empowering on the one hand, but on the flip side, is there are good reasons why you don't want to have stuff, just you don't want to have a bunch of confidential material floating out on a Dropbox share with a shared password, right? Like, we all know that's not a good idea for a variety of reasons. Um, we all know that when you get a bill at the end of the month from a development team and it's like $18,000 because they didn't spin down their EC2 instances, that's a real problem, right? But, I mean, the reason why they're doing this is because they're not getting the level of service that they were expecting. And I think all of this is just rooted in the fact that when IT can't keep up with the needs of the business, the business will route around IT. Um, and it's, the, it, you know, they're your competition in a lot of ways. I mean, your competition is Dropbox. Uh, you know, if someone can get away with doing that, you know, there's some amount of time where it's like, it'll take me two days to set that file show up. Okay, well, you know, maybe that's good. If it's like, Three weeks, then you know you may have a problem. So it's a good metric for kind of how slow are you, like how good are you at actually delivering the stuff that people are asking you to deliver. Um, so this is happening, and, and I think this is one of the things that this is the natural consequence of like ops not being able to necessarily move as fast as they need to. Move. Okay, so all that said, what do we actually do about this? Um, and I'm going to try and breeze through a bunch of this stuff, mostly because, well, A, normally we do this at the beginning of the day, uh, where you're probably more alert, and B, I mean, it sounds like there's been a bunch of talks already that kind of talk about the nitty gritty, so I'm not going to dwell too much on, like, what is a puppet and what is a computer, uh, but I'll at least try to hit the high notes, especially for the people that are pretty new to the system. I mean, it sounds like there's still a decent, you know, we have 30, 40% of you are. Um, but, Puppet, with respect to all the stuff that I've said, I mean, really what we're about is, you know, we're in the business of making it easier for people to make rapid, repeatable changes to your infrastructure. That's pretty much what the whole tool is oriented around. Like, all the talks you've probably seen today are oriented around those types of use cases, right? And under the hood, you know, we just want to make it easy for people to, you know, you automate the management of sort of common configuration stuff, like, common stuff that you need across your environments that will hopefully give you, a, you know, at, at the base level, it's like you just need some, the table stakes are, you need to at least have a certain amount of understanding and rigor about how your environment is set up at some base level so that you can actually have a platform upon which you can do more sophisticated automation. So it's really hard to automate stuff in an environment that is all unique and beautiful snowflakes. Like, it's really difficult. But if everything looks the same, or at least looks the way that you intend it to look, then you have way more ability to actually do these kinds of things that will help you move faster and more reliably. And obviously everybody knows most of the puppet types of providers, so I'm not going to go too deeply into this. Although if you're primarily in a Windows environment, there is a thing called SSH. <laughs> I love Windows users. Literally all I know about administering Windows is like, Microsoft Parts Network and Space Cadet Pinball and the Plus Pack from 1995. <laughs> I did try to write a Steam provider, actually, because I do have a Windows box and I play video games on it. I don't have any football analogies because I don't know all I know about sports is like based on what sports video games I've played. So, like, the last football game I played was Tecmo Super Bowl. <laughs> uh, so all my examples would be like Christian Okoye. Um, but yeah, like, Steam provider, that was tough. Steam doesn't really give you a good API, but I'd be interested in hacking on that with people if anyone else is a gamer. Um, I don't think there's anything I need to go into on that slide. So, in general, at a super high level, the approach we want to take, and again, you kind of notice that these four things align pretty closely to 1950. It's the state of the art for 1950s military standards. But, you know, it's basically about defining what you want to have happen. And then, you know, really at, at a super high level, you know, what Puppet cares about, maybe to contrast it with the, you know, million line bash scripts of the world, uh, is that, you know, what we want people to do is instead take a step back and think about how you want your systems to look and how you want them to behave. And you model that up front and then you let the tools figure that out for you. Because there's no reason to write a million line bash script anymore if you have higher level tools that can figure out a lot of that machinery for you. Right? You don't necessarily need to care whether it's user add or add user. 
I literally could not even tell you which one is actually appropriate on which operating system. And I kind of am offended that in 2015 sometimes I still need to care about that, because that's stupid. All I really want to say is I need to add a user with this ID, with this home directory, and with this name, and maybe here's a solved hash for a password. Um, which coincidentally would be sort of a description of that user in Puppet, as you saw in the previous talk, right? Like no one's saying add user in what order the flags need to be in. Um, because that's dumb. I don't think that's super useful information in the grand scheme of it. Good to know, but they're probably more important things to worry about. So once you define what you actually want, we have the ability to test those changes. And this again is sort of the contrast to the million line bash script, because what are the qualities of that bash script that you may have? Um, most likely, it is probably not necessarily able to be run more than once. It's super common. I go into environments, talk to customers, users all the time, where they have something that automates deployment of an app and you can't run it again. So I hope it works the first time, which of course I'm sure it will, because it's software. It's software always works the first time. Like, what if you don't want to actually deploy the software? You just want to see what changes you would make to the system to install the software. You just want to dry run, but you don't want to actually perturb anything, because maybe it's production infrastructure. Right? Like, unless you've written like if then around literally every single command you do in your bash script, that's not going to happen. Most people do not do stuff this way. If you model things in a higher level language like Puppet, then what we can do is we can actually say, all right, well, you need this user with this ID, this package needs to be installed, this config file needs to have a certain content in it, you know, it needs to have these settings, uh, and the service needs to be running. And what we can tell you is you can run it on a system in dry run mode called no op mode. And then we could actually say, interrogate the local system and say, do you have this user already? Oh, you do. What's the UID? Oh, that's not the one you need. And we can admit, like, if we were to run for real, we would have to flip this UID. Is this package installed? Yes. Oh, but it's not the right version. Or maybe it's not installed at all. We could say, you know what, if you ran this for real, we would have to install this package. So suddenly, that gives you way more safety for testing out these changes in your actual production environment without disturbing your actual production environment. You know, and that's a huge level up for a lot of people. Um, next, you can actually flip it from dry run mode to for reals mode. We really should have a flag that's like for reals, uh, but we don't. Uh, and you know, it'll actually make the system conform to what you want in your model, what your model says it should be. Right? So that's all gravy. And then lastly, because that auditing piece, that auditing and verification piece is very important, we generate a report of what actually happened. And you can take that and pump it into whatever other system you want. If you're running Puppet Enterprise, it's built in. If you want to store it as a file on disk, you can do that. If you want to pump it into a lock stash cluster or a Splunk cluster, you can do whatever you want, but you will at least have the information there that tells you, when I tried to configure this system or reconfigure this system, this is what actually happened. And the nice thing about this is you can repeat all of this as many times as you want. Just have Puppet run like on a cadence, run every hour, run once a day, whatever you think makes sense. And effectively, what that, what that gives you is it's kind of like an immune system for your infrastructure. You have all these models that define what you want stuff to look like, and you have this toolkit, you have this immune system just making sure in the background that the systems that you own always look the way that you want them to look. And you don't have to worry about it because it's automation that takes care of this stuff for you. So yeah, it's very powerful. Everybody's probably seen, you know, puppet code already because um, a lot of people have been talking about it. So I won't delve into too many details, but qualitatively, at least, you know, maybe if you want to explain this to other people or other people you work with that aren't super puppet savvy, or what is the point, or why does this look this way? The main goal here is we wanted to come up with something that looks more like a, config like a configuration file, and instead of looking like a super, instead of looking like C. You know, there's no like public static void bullshit going on anywhere in here, right? It looks like a config file. You can hand this to someone that probably doesn't really have a lot of understanding of a lot of this, and you're like, oh, package open SSH server. That probably means you're messing with the package open SSH server. And, you know, there's no real, there's, there's not a lot of mystery. But I think that's the reason why it kind of tends to look the way it is. It's a simple to read syntax. You can easily share it with people, even people that aren't like developers. You, know, you don't have to be a developer, and I don't, like, I don't want people to be developers. And I guess this is sort of a philosophical difference. You know, I'll get on the soapbox a little bit, but I think this is kind of a philosophical difference that, you know, maybe as an engineer or puppet, I think that we have relative to a lot of other tools, which is there's definitely a power continuum, for sure, no joke. You know, and I think on one end of the continuum is like, here's your full-blown programming language, a pretty low-level toolkit and framework, and you can build literally whatever you want on it. That's great, right? I think that's totally fine. 
People can vote, people can and do take advantage of stuff like that, do whatever it is that they want to do. And you can build all kinds of crazy stuff. The flip side of it, though, is you kind of need to be a developer in order to use a full-blown language like that to develop a lot of things. And you start running into the kinds of problems that developers normally have. Which again, I'm a developer, so I don't think that's necessarily bad. But when I look at the broad market of systems administrators, I don't necessarily see people that have a huge a huge amount of depth in like hardcore software development practices, nor do I think they necessarily should, because I've also run into a ton of developers who don't understand like how a switch works. You know, so I'm like, uh, you know, I think there's definitely different strokes there. So I think where we kind of end up on the continuum is like, okay, what can we do that makes our stuff, that makes it easy for people to automate things without having to develop an entirely parallel, extremely specialized set of skills? Right? And I think that's why we end up with the syntax we do, and that's why we have a lot of the features that we have. And, you know, and I, I think you shouldn't trust anybody that says that like, any piece of software is better like, objectively than any other. I think it's all about trade-offs. And you know, I can be candid with folks here, and I think that's like the trade-offs that we make, I think, as, a, as an upstream, right? as an open source project. It's like, you know what, we're aiming for the 99%. And I think you can do a whole lot, and there are a ton of hooks available. There's a ton of customizations if you want to go into that. Like you can, of course, write like Ruby plugins and things like that. But certainly, as someone in charge of engineering for Puppet, I view the future of Puppet not being in requiring that people know a sophisticated language in order to extend the system to automate what they need to do. I think the future of Puppet is more about letting people write plugins in whatever language they want. And that can be that, that can be Python, that can be Perl, that can be whatever. Because I'm too old to get into a debate about what language you need to use that makes you better than someone that's using something different. If Wikipedia and Facebook can be written in PHP, I'm pretty sure you can build anything out of anything. Um, and it's kind of, it's a tired art. So, anyway, I'll just I'll leave you with that. Uh, um, because, you know, I don't know that too many people have talked about Windows so far today. Um, I mean, it's pretty big, it turns out. Uh, well, how many people have Windows servers as part of the infrastructure that they, that they manage? Yeah, so that's like 70% of people in this room. Wouldn't it be nice if you could manage that using the same tool chain that you use to manage all of the other infrastructure you have? Uh, I think it probably would be. Um, so, you know, Puppet, we have agents that work on Windows that integrates in all the same expected ways that you would expect it to work on like a Linux system or a Unix system, right? Like you can manage, you know, users and groups, services that get done through the actual Windows services API, you can install packages, you can enable or disable Windows features, the kind of stuff that you do through a control panel. We have structured support inside of resource types for rebooting a system after certain packages are installed. You obviously don't want to do that halfway through a Puppet run. You want to like batch those things up and maybe do it in a structured way, compliant with whatever maintenance windows you have. So all that stuff is in there and I think it's good. And they only pop this up to just demonstrate to people that, you know, it's not necessarily for the you know, for, for the Linux people in the universe, like you don't have to be running like Arch Linux, March 10, you know, 2015 in order to take advantage of this stuff. Like, if you're running, I think you do have to be on at least like 2003 server for Windows, but I don't know, I'm sure they'll end the life that when RHEL 4 gets into life, which I think is 2050 or something like that. Um, RHEL 4, I talked to a customer recently that was running a Red Hat, uh, Red Hat 5, not RHEL 5, but Red Hat 5 servers, uh, which I think I had some, and I got the DVD to, or the CD to install in the back of the book, like it runs available in like the late 90s. Um, good hardware, I should ask the best one gear they're running it on that keeps running. Um, obviously, you don't have to do all of this stuff yourself. I think one of the big things that and I think we get some of this just architecturally, the way Puppet is built, it's kind of oriented in such a way that because it's got that sort of very high level config file looking syntax and you don't have a bunch of super complex, like mega nested, arbitrarily complicated logic, we kind of get a lot of benefits out of the box. Like most modules, it's not too difficult. I mean, obviously you can build them in such a way that's hyper specific to your infrastructure, but a lot of them are written in a way that's pretty easily shared to other users. And that's kind of one of the main goals I think we have is, you know, chances are whatever job you're in, whatever thing you need to automate, whatever software you need to deploy, you are probably not the only person on the planet that has to deploy that or that has deployed that, right? So why, why are we, why are we spending our time, you know, doing all these things? I think maybe to touch on sort of 
you know, I think this is a place where I think, honestly, a lot of operations staff kind of lags behind a lot of development staff because I think the software development side of the universe has kind of jumped in on the reusable code and libraries bandwagon quite some time ago. But I think operations still definitely lags behind that and a lot of jobs are kind of like, we do this here, like our infrastructure is special, we have to build this this way. Like, maybe it's special, but I'm sure there's a huge chunk of it that probably is common and is probably shared between a lot of people. Um, so that's why we have the Puppet Forged. There are thousands and thousands of modules on there to manage all sorts of things. I would say even if one of those doesn't work for you right out of the box, it certainly is probably worth us as a starting point to at least take a look at it, see where it breaks down in your environment. Maybe it needs an additional argument to a certain defined type, like because you need some configurability, the person who maintains the module didn't think that they needed. You could file a pull request for that. Get that put upstream, get a different community of people maintaining that for you. But it's less stuff that you necessarily have to maintain yourself because there's a community of other systems administrators out there, of other Puppet users out there that want to help and that are actively helping. Um, there are tons of pull requests that go into modules literally every minute. Uh, people trying to do stuff and automate things better. So we should just all remember to take advantage of it. I'm not going to dwell on sort of the life cycle of a Puppet sort of check-in um, too deeply, but you know, really briefly under the hood, it's basically like, and everyone here probably already knows this, but you have agents that live on all of your systems, and you know, we've got Windows, Linux, and we've got Unix, but I do want to mention that uh, it's interesting, um, I think our CEO and me and a couple of other folks, and he posted a tweet uh, where he had a bet, uh, where he said, I wonder if, um, network admins or storage admins, which ones will go kind of DevOpsy first? And uh, who thinks it's storage people? Yeah, how many of you are storage people? That's it. <laughs> who, think it's net who thinks it's network? Yeah, okay. I kind of feel that it's network if for no other reason than we've gotten way more traction with network vendors much more quickly than we have with storage vendors. But the long term is everybody wants it. People are like, why would you want to tell them into a switch and then run these like stupid bullshit commands from 1982 to like flip a port? That's dumb. Why can't you just, I mean, that's like the bash script of your that most admins in this room have realized like that's stupid. Like there are higher level tools for that. Why can't you model that stuff in Puppet and have that continuously checked? You know, why can't you say the manipulation of a port on a switch, you know, all my app servers need to make sure that they're added to a bit on a load balancer. Why do you need to go to the load balancer and manually add these systems and why can't you make that part of the model of the puppet code for your app? So that when it comes to ensure that I am in this bit, it will check if it's in there, if it's not in there, it will add it. And then there you go, you're good. By virtue of bringing the systems up, you are now sort of in conformance. So, you know, it's the idea of being able to have a model that spans more of your infrastructure than, you know, just one operating system. You know, it's multiple operating systems and it's multiple devices and things like that. This is also coincidentally why for the eggheads, why, um, you know, if you follow the public development list, like why we're moving towards porting most of our agent side stuff from being run in Ruby to basically like it can be compiled with GCC and stuff like that because that's the way that you can get it running on storage devices, network devices, your Raspberry Pi. Um, that kind of stuff. Uh, so anyway, agent wakes up, collects some facts and metadata about itself, sends it to the master where you actually have all of your code available, where you describe how you want your systems to look. We compile the config for that system and we send it back. Another interesting distinction I would say between Puppet and maybe other tools that you're using or stuff that's homegrown is one thing to note is that um, the config we send back to each system is literally just the config necessary to configure that one system and nothing else. So sort of from a security standpoint, it's the principle of privilege, right? Like your app server may not need to have the configuration for what your database machine looks like. But a lot of tools where the way that you model your systems is just like, man, here's a bunch of code. Uh, the only way you know what config applies to what system is by running all the code, which means you have to sync all that code to every system, which means if anybody breaks into any of your systems, they will have all of the configuration information for everything on your infrastructure. Maybe not all of the key data values, but they'll at least know how all of your stuff is set up, which honestly, in 2015, may be enough. I mean, hell, our reference sneakers could do a bunch of crazy shit. That was like 15 years ago. Imagine what you could do now, right? All of the information. And then we send a report when we're done that, again, you know, you can sort of centralize and do stuff with. There are additional projects that work and cooperate with Puppet that kind of up-level what you can do. Um, PuppetDB is an example where basically we centralize and store all of those facts for all of your systems 
as well as every single model that you have that describes what you want all of your systems to look like, as well as every single report of every single puppet run that you've done. So what that means is you instantly, just by standing it up and setting, you know, tweaking one setting on your Puppet Master, you end up with a database that has a complete inventory of all of your systems, and it has a complete record of what you want all your systems to actually look like, and it has a complete record of what actually happened when Puppet ran on those systems. How many, you know, how many systems do I have where the version of OpenSSH I'm managing is something that's partly vulnerable? You know, like, there you go, you've got it all. You don't have to run anything fancy. You have all that stuff kind of that. How many Windows systems do I have? How many Linux systems do I have? All that stuff you kind of get for free. But again, because by doing the work of modeling that stuff up front, this is an example of where that power can be extended out to do something much more useful. We have a companion project called Web Collective, which does, it's sort of a messaging fabric that allows you to do ad hoc commands. And one thing I also want to say, more as a philosophical thing, is I think, I think a lot of folks get sort of wedged in this idea that yeah, you have config management, you have a tool that models stuff. Obviously, every sysadmin task you want to do has to be done through that tool, which is bananas. That makes no sense. There are plenty of ad hoc tasks that people want to do, even though, like, sure, I made software that's primarily oriented around modeling the universe. There are plenty of tasks people want to do that it makes no sense to model it. Right? Like, I have a maintenance and I just need to turn the service off for like 10 minutes and then I need to bring it back up again. Right? Is that really a change you want to make to the model of your system? I mean, we could wax poetic about the philosophical ramifications of that, but I think practically, people just want to they can quickly shut something down and then get stuff happening. Or there are ad hoc commands that you may want to run. If you're doing that for 90% of your administration, maybe that's an anti-matter, obviously. But there's no reason why, I mean, you know, we're all, we're all adults here, so I think it's foolish to say that everything can be done in a structured model fashion and there's no room in the universe for an ad hoc command execution. Um, I, just, I just don't think that's true. When I started a puppet, we used to have shirts that said, like, SSH before we would cut it. Um, and that's why you need puppet. And I'm kind of like, yeah, I don't, shirt's stupid, because there are plenty of use cases where actually that's completely useful. Um, you just don't want to rely on it, because you end up sort of with that habit. But, you know, it's 2015, it's okay. Um, probably the most recent project that we've been working on, that, that's, um, we just had a 1.0 maybe a couple of months ago, 2.0 I think may have just been released like a couple of days ago, maybe it's the last week. Um, 3.0 will probably come pretty soon, is Puppet Server. And then again, you know, sort of like previously I mentioned all the agent side stuff we're trying to port over from running in Ruby to running into a more portable and kind of faster runtime is we're kind of doing the same thing on the server side where you know, we've gotten tons of feedback from customers and open source users where you know, right now the combination of running a bunch of Ruby stuff, plugging it in with Passenger, having that be fronted you know, with Rack, and plugging that into a fronting web server, I mean, it's a ton of moving pieces. Any of them can have a problem, it makes things a lot more difficult to debug. Ruby is also single core, which means that if you have eight cores and you run eight processes, I hope you don't have more than eight systems checking in at the same time because you'll end up with stuff queuing. So there's a ton of technology out there, and a lot of this came from just extracting it out of PuppetDE, where we can actually run on a properly multi-threaded runtime that's genuinely faster. Um, so I encourage people to try it out, uh, unless you're in a very, and we've literally run um, experiments on like the Forge, and we've got tons of users of Puppet Server already. Like the number of users where they've had incompatible modules is probably in the single digits, I would say. Um, mostly if you're running something where you're using a gem that uses some Pretty weird exotic native code, um, and there's no like JRuby equivalent. Which at this point, basically none of them. I mean, even like high-rank YAML and stuff like that continue to work just fine. So I encourage people to check it out. Benchmarks show us being able to, you know, agent runtime compared to like a Puppet 3.6 system running with Passenger. If you have Puppet Server, you know, agent runtime is anywhere from like you know twice as fast, maybe three times as fast, to just like pipelining and faster, you know, SSL and stuff like that, all the way down to compile times have gone significantly down. So I would encourage people to check it out. And it also has much better behavior and saturation like if you have a thousand nodes checking in at the same time. Uh, the percentage of the responses that they around, you know, is much better now. All right, there's, uh, for people that still need to do provisioning, whether it's bare metal or virtual, we do have a project called Razor, which is sort of a rules-based engine for doing provisioning for all of your systems. So you don't need to put in manually, like, here's the MAC address, here's what operating system it is. You set up rules, it boots up into a microkernel that actually runs Factor, one of our projects, to collect metadata about the system. So you can just say, you know what, if a system comes up and it's got 32 cores, two terabytes of RAM, and it's like you know, this many disks on whatever controller, probably a database machine. 
So I'll provision it with, it's a Red Hat 7 box, here's the partition layout, here's the packages you need. And it's the last step in Kickstart, install the Puppet agent and then run Puppet. So you can power on a system and then have it puppetize uh, with very little effort, so I encourage people to check that out. Sounds like people have already talked about Pyra and R10K, but I'm running low on time, so you can ping me afterwards and I'm happy to talk about it. So the last thing I want to talk about is, you know, under the hood, there's sort of the open source like Puppet platform, which is all the core stuff we're talking about. It's Puppet, it's Factor, it's Puppet TV, it's Razor, it's a couple of other things. But, you know, on top of that, there are a bunch of applications that we have in Puppet Enterprise that sort of are designed to streamline common workflows that we see in most commercial companies that we talk with, right? And a lot of that you've already seen in the demo this morning. So I'm not going to really talk about it too much. Like, I'm not going to talk about Node Manager because I believe they already demoed the classifier. I did want to talk about Operations Manager, which is kind of interesting, but Puppet Server, if you're running it on PE, is instrumented pretty crazily. Um, so for those of you who have a pretty large Puppet installation where you want to get metrics out of your Puppet Server, you can get stuff, and this is just pumping it into a Graphite Grafana, for those of you familiar with that. Um, but you can use whatever dashboard um, that can handle sort of JMX metrics. But this is everything from current request queue into a compiler, uh, how long every function call takes if you have an expensive function, how long current compiles are taking, how many active requests you have. So it's stuff that just helps you manage the health of your puppet environment. So I think the demo already covered a method inspector, so I'm not going to talk about that either. So lastly, just to wrap up, I want to say um, obviously the community is very important to us. And, you know, we're hugely committed to building a ton of what we think is pretty good open source software. Um, so if you want, I encourage everyone to get involved. And again, you don't have to be a developer to get involved. A lot of people that contribute um, are not developers. A lot of people that build modules that work on module pull requests, like, do you run Apache? Do you run Nginx? Do you synchronize your time with NTP? Like, we have modules for that, and people have bugs, and people file pull requests for those modules. So I'm pretty sure anyone here has some project relating to Puppet that they could contribute to and we definitely welcome that. Feel free to ask questions and get involved. Um, there's the Puppet IRC channel, which I encourage folks to be on. Um, and you know, I'm on there, a bunch of other developers are on there. If you don't know a whole lot, there's plenty of learning material that you can look at online. One of the more recent things that we rolled out is there's now like online videos and stuff like that for people that are very new and kind of interactive exercises where you can go through them all from home. I think that stuff's actually pretty cool. Um, there's a ton of docs. We do training, um, that does cost money. But uh, one thing I will mention though is for the first time we've started offering Windows specific training because obviously all our old training for an intro class it's like, all right, everybody fire up BI and then edit your, you know, let's, let's manage SSH. Like that doesn't resonate with Windows administrators because you know, they have a different set of things that they're interested in doing first. So we do have Windows specific stuff now. Um, and then lastly, I would say we also have a test pilot program. Any of you can sign up for this. And this is basically when we're thinking about crazy new ideas, crazy new features, we just need like lab rats basically. <laughs> you know, we'll send you some free swag, but it's like, look, you know, Skype will put something on the screen, like maybe it's a mock-up, and we'll be like, click through this. What do you think it does? Like, what would you expect to have happen if you hit this button? And then that's kind of it, because we need that research to help us make better decisions, and that's what test pilots are, so sign up there. And then at the very end, I'll say, I encourage everyone to come to PuppetConf. This year, it's uh, back and forth, quote unquote, home for a lot of Puppet Lab employees. But not me, because I'm based out of here. I'd rather be here than important. Yeah. It's a softball, people, come on. Um, yeah, so I think that's it. Um, so, you know, I think I'm right at the end of my time, so I'm probably not going to have any questions. But I'm going to be around the rest of the day, and I'll be across the street in the pub later tonight. Um, if anybody wants to pick my ear. So thank you all very much.